Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to the eighth annual W.B. Du Bois uh, lecture. This lecture is in honor of uh, a commitment to Pan-Africanism, the liberation, unity, and further development of African peoples wherever they are in the world. It is named after W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the founding fathers of the concept of Pan-Africanism. It is a joint project of the Center for African Studies and the African American Studies and Research Program, and one of the ways in which we show a kind of coming together of peoples of African descent. Uh, today's lecture is entitled, The 21st Century Color Lines and Other Lines, and our speaker is William Fletcher. Bill Fletcher, Jr., um, let me say it's an honor and a privilege to introduce Bill Fletcher, Jr. He's been one of the down-on-the-ground activists for labor and for African-American, Pan-African issues for probably the last 30 years. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce him. Bill Fletcher, Jr. is president and chief executive officer of Trans-Africa Forum. Some of you may not be aware of Trans-Africa Forum, but it's the longest living and the most important organization dedicated to keeping issues of Africa and the Caribbean on the register of uh, presidential administrations, Congress, and also mobilizing the community around issues of concern on the African continent and in the Caribbean and helping and working to provide those connecting threads uh, between blacks throughout the world. Bill Fletcher Jr. was formerly the Vice President for the International Trade Union and Development Programs of the George Meany Center, the National Labor College of the AFL-CIO. Prior to his service at the Meany Center, Bill served as Educational Director and later Assistant to the President of the AFL-CIO. Bill's union staff experience started in Boston, Massachusetts as an organizer for the District 65 United Auto Workers. This was later followed by his role as the organizational secretary, administrative director for the National Postal Mail Handlers Union in Washington, D.C. Um, while in Boston, Bill also served as adjunct faculty member at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he was connected with the Labor Studies Program. Um, as I tried to imply earlier, Bill has been a quintessential scholar activist throughout his career. After leaving the mail handlers, he went on to work in the National Office of the Service Employees International Union, where he held various positions, the last being assistant to the president for the East and the South. Bill got his start in the labor movement as a rank and fowler, uh, working in the industrial union for marine and ship building workers of America at Quincy, Massachusetts, combining labor and community work. He was also involved in the organizing efforts to desegregate the Boston building trades. Um, I know Bill through the Black Radical Congress. He was one of the co-founders of that organization, which is the latest incarnation of United Front organizing efforts on the part of African Americans. Uh, it remains a very significant organization, raising the kind of issues and pushing the kind of agenda that appeals to uh, the grassroots of the African American population. Um, Bill is a graduate of Harvard University and has authored numerous articles and published a variety of books, newspapers, and magazines. He is also the co-author of a pictorial booklet, The Indispensable Ally, Black Workers in the Formation of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, 1934-1941. It is, again, with great pleasure and honor that I introduce Bill Fletcher, Jr. Thank you for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I very much appreciate the invitation that was extended to me today, and I, I, want, to, um, I want to start by talking about the fact that in a few years, if we're not active, these kind of gatherings will not happen. Um, there's a right-wing assault on thinking that's taking place around this country. 
And what made me think about it was just yesterday I was reading a paper in Washington. And there were these people in a high school that are attacking a peace studies class. And they're saying that the teacher has uh, a point of view. There's an idea, isn't it? I was trying to remember what teachers did I know that did not have points of view. Um, I mean, I was thinking about my third grade teacher, Ms. Rocchio, who had a very strong point of view that irrespective of what the Supreme Court said, we should be praying that uh, what black folks had to say was irrelevant. I mean, she had a very strong point of view. I'm trying to remember when there wasn't a point of view. I think about in eighth grade, one of my teachers that effectively encouraged me to question but the, there's this right-wing assault that's underway, and there are people like uh, David Horowitz, a former leftist, uh, from a uh, one-time editor of Ramparts magazine, who's carrying out this witch hunt against people who think. And so I think it's, a, it's very important, it's incumbent upon us to not take it lightly that we have this kind of gathering. Because there are people out there that want these gatherings suppressed. And to the extent to which we remain silent, there will be. So I, I wanted to offer that in the beginning because I very much appreciate this. I appreciate everyone taking their time to be here and inviting me. But I'm looking forward to the dialogue. In thinking about this presentation, I, I wanted to actually begin with uh, two notes. One has to do with Du Bois, and um, I was realizing in putting this presentation together that Du Bois in many ways feels like a member of my family. And that's because Du Bois and my great-grandfather, a man named William Stanley Braithwaite, who was a, uh, a, a very important pre-Harlem Renaissance black writer, poet, uh, was one of the people that helped Robert Frost get his start. Um, he and Du Bois were very, very close. And there was a point in the 1930s when Du Bois was under attack. And my great-grandfather was one of the organizers. And I didn't even know this. Right? I saw this in a documentary. No one in the family bothered to share this. But he was one of the chief organizers of this major rally in Harlem in the 1930s to defend Du Bois. And, um, and Du Bois, like many other people, also found himself at 409 Edgecombe Avenue in Harlem. It was an apartment, is an apartment building, but it's an apartment building where the likes of Thurgood Marshall, Count de Cullen, uh, Du Bois, my great-grandfather and great-grandmother, lived. And um, he was a, it was a major presence and someone that my great-grandfather considered a friend and a colleague, even if they didn't necessarily agree politically. The second thing I wanted to say is that I owe a special political debt to Du Bois that Du Bois, as you may know, was one of the leaders of something called the Council on African Affairs. He and Paul Robeson, after the end of World War II, helped to put this organization together, which was a very interesting organization. It spearheaded an effort to build a constituency in the United States that was concerned about Africa and concerned about US policy toward Africa, and at that point, particularly the issue of African liberation and decolonization. Um, the Council on African Affairs uh, was in some ways the ideological and organizational ancestor of Trans-Africa Forum. You can see much of what we've attempted to do when you look at the work of the Council on African Affairs. Council of Af on African Affairs, however, was destroyed. It was hounded and destroyed in the anti-communist McCarthy era. Uh, it, was, it was hounded at a point when anyone that questioned US foreign policy, and does this sound familiar, was considered a, a malcontent, in this case a communist, today a terrorist, or someone that collaborates with terrorism. And the Council on African Affairs was ultimately destroyed. Um, Nevertheless, the work of the Council on African Affairs went on, and it was represented in a number of organizations. In the 1970s, the African Liberation Support Committee, in many ways, could also tie its heritage, uh, its lineage, to the Council on African Affairs. So it's very important to me to be here today to talk with you 
and to speak uh, about the issue of Pan-Africanism, uh, although my remarks will be somewhat critical and they hopefully will be somewhat provocative, I will undoubtedly step on some toes so it's okay to say ouch. Over 100 years ago, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois offered his famous and very prescient view that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. This quote has been used as ad nauseum, and it has come to mean different things to different people. So let's take a moment, as my South African friends would say, and unpack this quote. Du Bois used the term color line to speak about white supremacy as well as what came to be known as the national colonial question. The principal contradiction for most of the 20th century was identified as being between those forces supporting white supremacy and national colonial oppression versus those in opposition. This proved to be basically correct, though at key moments, other contradictions superseded these. For example, World War I, which was essentially a battle of empires, and World War II in the struggle between fascism and anti-fascism. I should, however, add, borrowing from Aimé Césaire, one could look at fascism as the barbarism of, the nation, of national colonial oppression brought home to the developed world. To say that the color line was to be the decisive question of the 20th century did not mean that it would be the only question. This has been a mistake committed by many individuals and movements. At any point in history, there is always a principal struggle or conflict which over, either overshadows others or significantly influences other struggles or conflicts. Yet these principal contradictions or struggles are themselves influenced and shaped temporarily, and I mean that in the literal sense of time, by subordinate contradictions. This follows from my understanding of what French philosopher Louis Althusser defined as overdetermination. Du Bois clearly embraced this notion, at least by the early uh, 1930s. A reductionist analysis, however, often prevailed in the movements for national freedom, a reductionism that came to serve specific interests as events unfolded. It is essential to add that race or the color line did not happen to surface as the decisive conflict Du Bois referenced. Central to the construction of capitalism has been race, whether one begins with the English conquest of Ireland, which one could argue introduced racial oppression, albeit without a color line, or the combination of the invasion of the Western Hemisphere and the African slave trade and the introduction of the color line. Race played a central role in the creation of methods of social control and expropriation over all oppressed populations. In the US context, the white skin became a uniform sought after by all European immigrants as a means of becoming part of, or hoping to become part of, the dominant, although not ruling, bloc in this country. Another name for this process was that of becoming American. As such, it is actually impossible to discuss US capitalism as an abstract economic concept. US capitalism is and has always been a racialized capitalism, with race serving as the mortar holding the system in balance. Du Bois, in his monumental work, Black Reconstruction in America, theorized this notion quite graphically. Pan-Africanism as a concept, indeed as a series of concepts, and as a movement developed in the context of the struggle against national colonial oppression. I offer the notion of Pan-Africanism as a series of concepts because it would be overstating the case to suggest that it has ever been a coherent ideology. It has been more of an orientation. Yet with the leadership of individuals such as Du Bois, it came to represent a remarkable synthesis of anti-imperialism and black consciousness. Though within that synthesis, there were always degrees of tension, as well as varying political ideological tendencies. Pan-Africanism came to be a major influencing factor in the anti-colonial struggles in Africa and the Caribbean. In addition to the first five Pan-African Congresses and the leaders who emerged from them, the formation of the Organization for African Unity was seen by many leaders and movements as a step toward continental unity and a Pan-African vision. Regional discussions towards unification appeared to be steps toward the achievement of this vision as well. Yet differences and challenges quickly arose and were often left unanswered. These included, but were not limited to, 
the question of post-colonial national boundaries in Africa, ethnic issues throughout the African world, a common analysis of the character of post-colonial regimes, how the diaspora in Africa should interact, gender, class, and the post-independence relationship to imperialism and global powers. In the context of the struggles for national independence and liberation, the hegemonic forces and organizations within these movements generally ignored or suppressed subordinate contradictions. Or they interpreted these subordinate contradictions in ways which symbolically recognized their significance while substantively downplaying their relevance or importance. Examples abode, women's organizations created and upheld at the same time lacking any real political independence and existing at the same time that there was only limited discussion of gender. Another example would be class, where this was largely handled through the creation of trade unions, but where there was little substantive discussion about classes and class struggle within the national movements themselves. With the focus on the resolution of the national colonial question and in the midst of the Cold War, this linear approach toward contradictions seemed to work, at least for a while. Yet simmering in the pot were these explosive tensions often handled administratively, and I use that term loosely, including through military methods by the leadership of the National Independence Movement, two examples being notorious purges in Angola by the MPLA and within Zimbabwe in ZANU. The top blew off and the situation began to unravel as time went on. Pan-Africanism as a unity of anti-imperialism and black consciousness, particularly with the end of formal colonialism and the end of the Cold War, faced a set of new and potentially devastating challenges. It was one thing to unite in opposition to colonialism. It was yet another to confront a neo-colonial system and forge a national identity, as in the identity within a nation state. There were additional complications that arose, including the fact that Pan-Africanism has largely focused on national independence and national liberation. This made sense in terms of the national colonial question, but what then about oppressed nations and national minorities of African descent in places such as the United States, Colombia, or Brazil? What also did Pan-Africanism have to say to the Caribbean states, either as a group, individually, or vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with Africa. Though the late Dr. Kwame Nkrumah attempted to theorize neocolonialism within a generally left-wing pan-Africanist framework, and the late Kwame Ture attempted to develop the work of his mentor, 20th century pan-Africanism found itself largely at a loss by the late 1970s. It also found itself splintering. In the United States, pan-Africanism lost steam while an ideolo ideologized Afrocentrism gained momentum. Not an Afrocentrism at the generic level of a concern to frame things within a black context, but rather a set of politics that emphasized the uniqueness, if not the exclusiveness, of people of African descent. This in contrast to a politics which emphasizes a movement to return to history. I would note, by the way, and encourage you to read Samira Amin's excellent work, Eurocentrism, which is about more than Eurocentrism and has some observations that are very relevant in examining Afrocentrism and various forms of fundamentalism. In the Caribbean, the definition of black began to break down by the 1980s, such that people of African descent and people of East Indian descent, once joined together politically as black, found themselves warring against one another. Within Jamaica, Trinidad, and Guyana, one has witnessed this horrific situation playing out, including through, as in the case of Trinidad, eth the ethnic correlation to various political parties. In Africa, various forms of fundamentalism, including but not limited to right-wing clerical politics, work to undermine both pan-Arabism and pan-Africanism, replacing a largely anti-imperialist secular or secular left religious alliance with a right-wing religious false orthodoxy. Having not linked the multiple layers of contradictions facing the African world or elaborated a process of resolution, Pan-Africanism retreated into a largely status construct, emphasizing the unification of Africa and even the inclusion of the diaspora, but under politics that were at best ambiguous. 
Thus, Pan-Africanism has been reduced in many quarters to support for the African Union, excitement about the African Union's interest in the diaspora, what the AU calls the sixth region, and admittedly some ambivalence toward the new Partnership for African Development, NEPAD. In other quarters, however, Pan-Africanism has taken on an even more troubling form, seeming to reduce its analysis of every world development to the prism of race, irrespective of the interplay of other contradictions, sort of a global black cultural nationalism. It is worth adding to this that what Samira Amin entitled as the national populist projects, the efforts at national liberation that were left-leaning but not thoroughgoing revolutionary, have run aground, raising significant questions as to what framework can guide the actual completion of the anti-imperialist and national democratic struggles. In this context, one must ask some very tough questions. Is Pan-Africanism dead? Or worse yet, is it an unburied, mummified corpse periodically displayed to remind the viewer of times of glory? Or in the alternative, is Pan-Africanism a concept of framework in transition? I believe that the answer is not self-evident. The questions must be approached coldly. It seems to me that Pan-Africanism can have a future, but on a different foundation. As noted earlier, national populist projects have largely run out of steam. While imperialism and white supremacy remain very much intact, they have mutated in form. White minority rule is over, colonialism is largely gone, people of African descent are often in power. What else can we ask for, some might pose. We must seek, in my opinion, to create a truly mass politics, which is a politics that serves the masses rather than serving elites. Thus, Pan-Africanism for the 21st century cannot limit itself to the realm of nation states, though this is certainly an important role. It must address an African world response to neoliberal globalization, the defining characteristic or dimension of this time. It must also represent a transformational politics in that it must be both revolutionary and liberationist. Pan-Africanism must stand against the so-called Washington Consensus and neoliberalism. In that sense, any African or African descendant leader who at one and the same time claims to embrace both neoliberalism and Pan-Africanism should be understood as operating at the nexus of a contradiction. Pan-Africanism must be a concept or framework that embraces redistributionist initiatives, as well as efforts that support not only national sovereignty, but also popular power. Pan-Africanism must also be a concept that embraces and supports the full emancipation of women. This includes, but is not limited to, how one tackles the HIV-AIDS crisis, issues of employment, the family, and power in society. To do this, the role of women in any transformational movement cannot be sidelined to a special organization, although organizations of women are certainly important. It must work its way into the full life of the movement, including the manner in which the movement is led and operates. Pan-Africanism, in other words, must place itself fundamentally at odds with misogynism. Pan-Africanism, ironically, must also be non-racial a suggestion that may sound not only controversial, but a bit oxymoronic, given that Pan-Africanism fuses anti-imperialism with black consciousness. No, what I mean is that Pan-Africanism must be black, and it must be solidly black. But black is not, at least in this context, mainly a question of skin color, or nor is it based on a place of origin. Black is a very political concept that poses itself in opposition to white supremacy, and is situated among people of African descent or people whose experience with national colonial oppression within the context of the African world has fused them with those with a more direct lineage to the continent. Thus, an Algerian has as much right to be a Pan-African as a South African. A Trinidadian of East Indian heritage has as much right to be a Pan-African as someone from Harlem. A Cuban or a Rwandan can join together as Pan-Africanists. Pan-Africanism of the 21st century, to reemphasize, must be mainly non-governmental. While we should seek to win the forces and power in the African world to a consistently Pan-African view, we must place our focus on the grassroots. We must recognize that many of those in power 
irrespective of their rhetoric or their intent, will be compromised by the forces of empire arising from the global north. Thus, our emphasis must be on the building of operational ties between progressive social movements in the African world. The African Social Forum, for instance, can be one such vehicle, particularly in and insofar as it reaches out to the diaspora. Sectorial movements within the African world can be additional vehicles for promoting this vision, for example, within the labor movement. Pan-Africanism must additionally be about class power and consistently siding with the dispossessed. This has been an Achilles heel for many advocates of Pan-Africanism. While it is certainly the case that Pan-Africanism concerns the African world, the new situation in which we find ourselves means that it is not always the case that former allies within the African world necessarily share the same objectives today. One can see in post-liberation societies where class has emerged as a defining feature in a struggle over contending visions regarding economic development, political power, and social organization. To explore this a bit more, some Pan-Africanists have been totally paralyzed or taken the wrong side, in my humble opinion, in responding to the crisis in Zimbabwe, where the anti-imperialist rhetoric of President Mugabe conceals a practice that is anti-worker and indeed anti-democratic. On which side should the Pan-Africanists be? What about the Darfur situation in the Sudan? Here again, there have been deep divisions among many progressives, including Pan-Africanists, who have essentially taken the position that if the West opposes the government of al-Bashir in Khartoum, that this must mean that we should support him. In today's world, such a framework simply does not work and sometimes places us on the side of the oppressor, even if that oppressor is small scale compared to the imperialists. The continued necessity for a pan-African orientation <clears throat> excuse me, in the 21st century should be evident if for no other reason than the continued importance of race and national oppression in today's world. Africa continues to be underdeveloped, treated as a natural resource pool by the G8. The Caribbean and the post-Cold War world has been marginalized, its economies in a disaster, while it is being relegated to a strictly tourism direction. Latin America, Latin America is an interesting case which is all too often not understood to be part of the African world. And it is witnessing two fascinating trends. One is an anti-empire trend, led especially by Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez and Cuban President Fidel Castro. This trend is calling for a completely different relationship between the countries of the global south with the global north, a theme consistent with pan-Africanism. The second trend has been the growth of social movements of people of African descent. These two trends overlap but are not identical. Nevertheless, they are critical for us to watch and support. For we in the United States, develops, developments in Latin America, particularly among Afro-Latinos, are largely ignored. But this may be the base camp, so to speak, for a remolded, reformulated pan-Africanism. These reasons should be enough for us to insist on a rejuvenation of pan-Africanism. Yet there is another reason, one that is a theme running throughout my talk. The mission of pan-Africanism did not end with national independence. It did not end with the formation of the African Union. It did not end with continental, it will not end with continental unification. Indeed, it will not even end when countries of the African world succeed in developing regional economic blocks to beat back the great bully from the north. The mission must be social transformation, or all that is trans, uh, excuse me, or all that is pan-Africanism will have turned out to be nothing more than a formality. People in the African world have fought for more than a flag and more than a seat at the United Nations. They have been fighting to improve their lives. In the post-colonial world, particularly in Africa, the lives of people improved until the mid-1970s. From that point on, in the aftermath of the oil shock and the 73-74 recession, there has been a steady decline. That decline has been compounded by the economic so-called remedies suggested by the IMF and the World Bank. Pan-Africanism as a trend has had, at best, an inconsistent response to this decline and how the nations and peoples of the African world should react. Is pan-Africanism of the 21st century, in other words, a justification for the incorporation of the African world into the neoliberal construct 
of a reorganized global capitalism? Or, in the alternative, is Pan-Africanism part of the progressive, indeed, revolutionary response to the barbarism emerging from this global capitalist reorganization and the empire associated with it? I do not think for a minute that Du Bois would have had any difficulty in answering that question. Do we? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's time for, I don't know what time we're going on to, but there's time for questions, but the request is that you have to speak at the mic. On the alternative, you can all say, Bill, that was like one hell of a speech. We all agree, and let's go party. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> yeah. Bill, can you uh, elaborate on the role that you see organizations such as the one that you had, Trans Africa Forum, but more generally, the role that you see of uh, African Americans and other Africans who are not on the continent but uh, located throughout the diaspora playing in a, in a rejuvenated Pan-Africanism. Thank you. In answering that question, I want to speak to the problem that Trans-Africa Forum faced. Um, this may sound like a tangent, but uh, bear with me. The, um, the founder of Trans-Africa Forum, uh, Randall Robinson, uh, very brilliant guy and very charismatic, um, but he didn't found the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. The anti-apartheid movement in the United States uh, was the result of 40 years of work that actually began before apartheid was introduced. It began right after World War II, in the United States at least, through the Council on African Affairs. And it was um, carried on by different organizations. In the 1980s, there were certain things that came together, and uh, Randall, um, reminding me of uh, this thing that Lenny Bruce once said about comedy, comedy was tragedy plus timing. Um, Randall understood timing, and at a certain moment, he and other key activists were able to ignite something on the basis of what was going on in South Africa. But by the 1980s, it was actually safe to oppose the apartheid government in the United States. In South Africa, it was a different question. But in the United States, to oppose the apartheid government, you could be a communist or you could be the chief executive office of Coca-Cola. And there was a very broad tent. Um, and, and within that tent, you had people, uh, black, white, Latino, Asian, everyone, um, and within black America, you had that, that spectrum. When the apartheid regime unraveled and ultimately collapsed, that front that exist, existed collapsed. And it became very evident at that point that the divisions that I mentioned in my talk emer emerged to the surface. And they played themselves out in different ways. And what I like to say is that for African Americans, in part because of the impact of the McCarthyite period in crushing left discourse and the discussion of class, we became very comfortable with the discourse simply of race. So we could unite against Portuguese colonialism, Spanish colonialism, white minority rule in, in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe or South Africa. But hold on to your hat. What do we do about Nigeria? when the military took over, wrapped itself in the flag of nationalism. What do we do um, about the Sudan, as I mentioned? When someone has all the right words, may even be talking about Pan-Africanism. Um, what do we do when someone talks about Pan-Africanism, but at the same time is embracing neoliberalism? 
like President Mbeki in South Africa. And, and so part of what I think has to happen is, is, uh, is ideological and theoretical, that there needs to be a debate. I think that we need to debate some of the issues that were raised uh, today in this talk. And we have to be prepared to have it out and have out the discussion, but not um, but the discussion has to be rigorous without being um, destructive. I'll give you an example. Um, I and some other people signed a letter a couple of years ago criticizing President Mugabe in Zimbabwe. And I was called by some people everything but a child of God. Because why? Because President Mugabe was upholding Africans. Why? Because he was grabbing the land back from the white farmers. And that was quintessential Pan-Africanism. Now, very few people discuss who actually got the land, right? Or why this was happening in the way it did, why President Mugabe had been very close with the white farmers at one point, and then like kind of what, why was the script being flipped? But all of a sudden, everyone is kind of rally around Mugabe. And, um, and, and, and some people accuse me of being a CIA agent. We've got, to have a, we've got to have a discussion. I've, I grew up during the COINTELPRO period. The COINTELPRO was the FBI's counterintelligence program used to destroy African-American organizations. And part of the way that they did this was to incite and very explosive um, debates among people. So people started shooting each other. We need to have debates. We need to have serious debates. But we cannot afford to be shooting each other. We've got to recognize that we're not going to agree on everything. There are going to be people that I will vehemently disagree with on Zimbabwe, and I'll agree with them on Venezuela, Cuba, or any number of other things. Um, we've got to decide you know, what is the necessary unity that we can work together and sometimes agree to disagree. So I think that on the one hand, we have to be prepared to have debates, and then those of us that can agree to work together should go forward and do that. Um, but it's going to be very, very difficult to, to carry this out because the divisions are very sharp. You know, when you look at a place like South Africa, where, which was, for many of us, the hope. I mean, we, we, we basically expected a revolutionary transformation in South Africa, only to find out within several months of the 1994 ANC electoral victory, a complete embrace of neoliberalism. This has been dismaying. Well, it's been dismaying for people in South Africa. But there's people there that want to have a discourse with us, and we should be having a discourse with them. And I think it's through that that we'll, we'll bring about a 21st century Pan-Africanism. But it's going to look different than what we experienced. And so in that sense, we can't fall prey to nostalgia. Do you, have any, do you have any comments on contradictions in the recent elections in Liberia? Um, well, the positive aspects is, uh, are, are two, I think, of the election are twofold. The woman is uh, uh, the president, and it was a relatively peaceful election. Now that said, um, I don't think that there's much of a future for small nations in this point in history. Um, during the Cold War, with the existence of two superpowers, um, small nations could often play off against one or the other and get resources and assistance. With this unipolar world and the, um, the barbarism coming out of Washington, uh, that becomes much more difficult. And with the reorganization of global capitalism, it becomes much more difficult for small nations to develop economically, uh, particularly small nations that have gone through a vicious civil war. The new president of Liberia is a product of the Washington Consensus. Um, and there's no indication that 
she's in favor of some sort of transformational economics or politics for Liberia. I obviously wish her well and, and uh, deeply hope that they can keep Charles Taylor out of Liberia. Um, and I hope for a peaceful situation. But I think that the reality is that, as in Latin America, small nations are going to have to find a way of blocking, creating regional economic blocks in order to, to uh, survive. I think this becomes in, in, um, particularly important in Africa and to some extent in the Middle East because the borders were not created by Africans. So you have a situation where, like if you think about Southern Africa, um, think about any part of Africa, these borders are completely bizarre. And the borders themselves inhibit the ability to have uh, constructive economic development. So, uh, so my hope is that through some sort of regional economic development, there can be, um, th that that really is the future. And, it'll be, and that Liberia can, be, uh, can contribute to that. In order for that to happen, though, there will certainly have to be a new set of politics that are introduced. Because many of the architects of the African Union <clears throat> that are talking about continental unity are at the same time embracing this thing called the New Partnership for African Development, which essentially, as a friend of mine likes to say, is a foundation proposal. It's not a real economic development strategy. And it's one that really um, kowtows to neoliberalism. Thank you for your talk and the care with which you uh, presented your ideas. Thank you. One of the, one, you said many things that spurred my interest, but one of the questions I have uh, relates to something you said. You said we need to insist on a revised pan-Africanism. And that caught my attention. It made me wonder, who do we insist to? What are the varieties of ways in which we insist? And um, Essentially, how do we make the case? Thank you. I guess part of what I'm trying to get at is that we've got to, we've got to defeat nostalgia. Um, and there's this, there was this thing I read in this book by Lukács once. And it was a discussion, it was like in 1921, and a German communist went to visit Lenin after the Kapp Putsch, K-A-P-P. -P. It was this military um, coup attempt in Germany. And um, they went and they went to talk to Lenin about what happened. And they had this whole elaborate self-criticism. And they said, and next time we'll be ready. And Lenin thought about it for a second and then turned to them and said, and what makes you think that German reaction will carry out its activities in the same way the next time. Um, one of the things that we often do is we keep fighting the last war. And, and, and even within Pan-Africanism, if we're tending to think in terms of 20th century frameworks, uh, we get ourselves into this real bind. And this issue, these issues, particularly of class and gender, I want to double underline, which were not major issues for Pan-Africanism in the 20th, 20th century. I mean, we can be apologetic and people can, can say, well, what, you know, such and such raised it. But I'm saying it wasn't a significant factor raised within the Pan-African discourse. So when I'm saying insisting, I'm saying that the kind of theory that we're developing, the kind of Pan-Africanist theory that we develop for the 21st century has to give more centrality to class and gender than we found in the 20, 20th century. That it has to give more attention to being on the side of the dispossessed, no matter what the dispossessed look like. And, and for that matter, no matter what the oppressor looks like. Right? So the fact that the oppressor may look like us and may use our language, dance our songs, wave our flags, know our language is irrelevant. The question is, what are they practicing? And uh, I think people become often deceived. So that's basically what I mean by insisting. It seems like you've answered my second question, so I'll go to the first one. Okay. Um, what, what has been the, or what was the um, agenda of TransAfrica for the last 20 years? I mean, since right after um, the demise of apartheid, my second question was about the, the vision for 
the 21st century. So if you still want to say a little bit about it. The, tra the Trans-Africa Forum vision for the 21st century? Sure. Okay. So, um, from roughly 1990 till when I took over, January 2002, Trans-Africa Forum was sort of zigzagging. What Randall attempted to do was, and I think he was very courageous, in taking up, for example, the military regime in Nigeria, the military regime that overthrew Aristide in, in uh, Haiti in 1991, I think he was attempting to um, say that it wasn't sufficient to have a racial discourse. And I think he, I think he deserves a lot of kudos for that. Um, the problem was that Randall, that the organization wasn't building, it, it, it lost sight of the need to build a mass constituency. And so what happened over time was that more and more was focused on Randall, the person. What Randall did, Randall's hunger strike around Haiti, Randall chaining himself to here and there. Um, my wife joked when I took this job, she said, I know you're not going to be chaining yourself to the State Department. I said, no, because I don't want to end up in Guantanamo. I don't have enough suntan lotion. Um, but you know, it's like, th that was the evolution. It was very much focused around Randall. Um, and I think that he was trying to grapple with this strategic problem, which is the post-colonial, post-apartheid situation, and what does it mean? But his responses were very, very individual. And it wasn't, when I say his, it wasn't just him by himself, because there were other people that went with this. When I took over what uh, Danny Glover, who's our board chair, what Danny and I attempted to do was to reframe the organization as being a black global justice organization. And we both succeeded and failed. Um, we rebuilt the organization. The organization was near collapse. Um, and we positioned the organization to be speaking out against empire. Um, but we ran across, and it plays itself out at the level of resources, we ran across the same dilemma. That is, that corporations that at one point, or foundations that might have supported the anti-apartheid struggle, were not going to support us when we're saying U.S. hands off of Hugo Chavez. They weren't. They weren't going to support us when we were saying, support Zimbabwean workers, workers, right? Um, they weren't going to support us when we were saying, end the blockade of Cuba. They just weren't. And, um, and so there's this, this dilemma that, that we and many other organizations have had in trying to build and sustain ourselves in the situation. Now, there's a specific problem, in, in, and I'm reluctant to say it, in mixed company, but I, I will say it, which is that um, African Americans, a friend of mine, he, he and I were talking the other day and we crafted it. We will fund our way to heaven, but we will not fund our way out of hell. Right? We will give money to churches and mosques. If you look at the stats, we are among the, uh, you know, um, uh, at demographic groups, we're among the greatest contributors and those, uh, to, to charities. But what are those charities? Churches and mosques. But when it comes to social activist organizations, we want the white folks to do it, right? And, and we'll come up with all kinds of great ideas. We'll sell some bean pies and, you know, you know, have a house party and stuff like that. But we won't come up with the money for the organizations. Not, I mean, some of these wealthy stars you know, um, uh, entertainers and people that have, people that play with money. I mean, literally, play with the green. I don't mean play in the Wall, Wall Street. I mean, take the money and throw it around their houses and can't find the time or the, the energy or the impulse to fund social activism. And, and so this is a real challenge. It's, a, it's an incredible ch the challenge that Black Radical Congress found itself facing and continues to face Trans Africa and many other organizations. And until we're able to figure out a way around that, 
we're in trouble. And many of the things that we did in an earlier period, we were able to get outside funding because of the nature of the battle. The battle lines have changed, and it means that our resources have to come in a different way. And this is, this is, a, this is an incredible dilemma. Uh, I heard you speak with considerable passion about the, the political agenda uh, and with some passing references to the economic uh, struggle. And I'm wondering whether you could uh, comment a little bit on how you see the, as it were, the reenactment and expansion of King Leopold's you know, scramble for Africa, which is manifesting itself in the form of you know, client states invading others and looting resources, and that uh, the focus is now in working with insiders who happen to be Africans who are insidiously playing the role of uh, fostering the uh, economic you know, powers or empires that they sought, and they call it globalism. So Nkrumah said, Siki, you first to write the, the political, political kingdom, kingdom but right. uh, the economic kingdom has escaped us. And now we find ourselves in a position where we are basically being, again, recolonized uh, economically. So perhaps if you could comment on it. Part of, thank you very much. I think part of the answer to that um, is contained in Samir Amin's critique of the national populist projects, it, which, um, and, and then I want to work my way backwards, by which what he, what he was talking about was that in the anti-colonial movements, there were variety of struggles and, and social forces that emerged that claimed to be against colonialism and imperialism and may have in their heads been Nasser in Egypt, for example, um, even Nkrumah uh, and others, but, but took the struggle to a certain point and stopped. That is, they did not fully engage the people in the transformation of their society. And, and so effectively, they developed top-down uh, social movements that were very dependent on charismatic individuals, and in some cases, political parties, but very often charismatic individuals. And when those char charismatic individuals were gone, Sekou Touré, whoever, the whole thing collapsed like a house of cards. The, um, because the, the, the politics may have in, in, in many ways been sincerely anti-imperialist, but, the, the, but, but, you, but it wasn't simply, liberation isn't, I think we can see now, isn't simply about getting the imperialists off our back in the sense of ending colonialism. It's about transforming social relations. And that is a very scary thought for many people because it means giving things up. It means changing things around. I, I'll give you an example that may sound a bit weird. I mentioned before in terms of the issue agenda, HIV AIDS pandemic. So in South Africa, there, is, there are these traditional healers that have said that a man can become cured of HIV and AIDS by having sex with a virgin. Now, this is an interesting formulation. It begs the question of how does a woman become cured, right? But it's, it's, it's very, very, I mean, this is an amazing formulation. So with that formulation in mind, there's all kinds of rapes going on of women and girls down to five. Um, and where's the political leadership? Where are the men, these great, bold, revolutionary men? Where are they? I mean, they're just taking a tea break or something? I mean, where are they? Why? Why do you not have more men standing up and saying that this is an atrocity? So in some sense, the national populist project, no matter what it was called, and National Democratic Revolution or the Arab Revolution or Arab Socialism or whatever you want to call it in different cases, took the movement to a certain point and then stopped because certain vested interests 
were going to be challenged if the movement went any further. Um, I think that that's fundamentally what the problem is. That's fundamentally why the imperialists have been able to get back in and to do exactly what you've been describing. Now, the second part is this. They never left. Now, we got to keep in mind, let's remember the Cold War. The um, Africa, since the, the, the end of, well, since the independence movements uh, succeeded, became a checkerboard in the Cold War. And both superpowers would use whatever means to win this country or that over to their side. Um, and there was pillaging going on and the support of pillaging. So you take Mobutu in Zaire. They, de they, de they de developed a term for his regime, a kleptocracy. Right? This man became one of the richest people on this planet by stealing from his own people. The West knew it. The United States, France, and Belgium helped him stay in power over three successive uprisings. But when the Cold War ended, he was no longer necessary. I mean, he was just, he was kind of, he was astounded that when the uprising started in 97, that the United States didn't come to his assistance. I mean, and, and understandably, he had been so much of a lapdog, he was on all fours. I mean, he really thought that he was the boy of the United States and that they would never let him fall, but he was no longer needed. So there was a, there was a small period when there appeared to be a kind of marginalization of Africa. But that really wasn't the case because what was happening was a sort of repositioning, a post-Cold War repositioning um, and, the, and the redevelopment of some of the client states. The 9-11 uh, had a particular impact on the United States in terms of Africa because Bush, when you, you might remember that when Bush came in, he said Africa didn't count. And in fact, his national security advisor, God bless her, was the voice for saying that, right? That Africa, did, Africa wasn't of strategic importance to the United States. After, November, after September uh, 11th, that all changed. And, and Africa became important because of oil and the so-called war against terrorism. And the United States has continued to do no damn good in Africa. It is, it is pushing militarization at a point when Africa needs to demilitarize. You know, they, they basically have decided that terrorism is the major problem for Africa. Terrorism, if you look at the history, if you look at current events, terrorism is simply not the major problem in Africa. Let's try civil wars, right? Let's try bizarre boundaries. Let's try poverty. Let's try HIV AIDS. But terrorism ain't it. It's just not. But the Bush administration, by pushing that, is feeding military, you know, weaponry in the countries that need no weapons. We should be demilitarizing. So I think that that's kind of a, a longish answer to your question. I think that there's been all these things that have been going on that have contributed to the re renewed scramble. And Africa remains a place where... Um, for natural resources. Now, one, fi one thing, uh, final thing, it has to do with export development, export-led growth. So, prior to 1997, the United States and Geneva and London would point to the so-called five tigers of Asia, and they would say to Africans, look, you know, you all got to get it together. Just look at, look at Thailand. Look at how well they're doing. Look at Indonesia. Look at Taiwan. Well, after 97 and the financial collapse, they didn't say that exactly. But they kept promoting this idea of export-led growth and that African countries will grow through exports. And this is really, um, this is a non-starter because the export-led growth is not helping to develop the economy for the people in those countries. This goes back to what I said earlier about regional economic development. You, in Southern Africa, you need Southern African economic development. Lesotho and Swaziland, with all due respect to the Lesotho and Swazi people, have no future outside of some sort of economic collaboration with South Africa. They just don't. 
there needs to be collaboration. But South Africa doesn't have a future either if it's not collaborating as opposed to having its corporations going in and playing a kind of sub-imperialist role in, in the rest of Africa. So I think that we need a transformational politics and, and that ultimately will mean that some people are going to have to be looking for another job. Um, thanks very much for a very inspiring talk. I think um, you've probably, in my consideration, laid out I mean, the manifesto, I think, for, if you want to, the next liberation struggle. Um, but of course, the detail, Thank the you. devil is more um, in the detail. Mm -hmm. I have a question that uh, relates to um, the proposition of the African Social Forum as a site for the reconstruction. And I think I want to agree with that proposition mainly because I think it sort of takes away the focus from a national to a sub-national right. level. And it's grounded in empirical practices. But there's also, uh, I want to argue, uh, swirling around, and one of the importances of the African diaspora and its continent, it still represents, I think, the most profound reservoir for anti-modernity thinking, right. as part from the genocides that obviously was, was practiced. Um, one of the platforms that I think um, maybe it's been neglected, and I'll just sort of you know, tease it out up front, I think is um, the whole notion of you know, social justice uh, with, uh, uh, grounded in some ecological reconstruction. I think one of the thinkings now post-nationalism or false is that we can't have social justice unless we're going to work at you know, trying to preserve the livelihood systems on which that social justice is going to be based on in itself. And this mm -hmm. brings into focus, of course, the whole question of the resource uh, wars that are currently, and have always been, you know, ravage, uh, uh, ravage, uh, ravaging the Southern African continent. But <clears throat> let me try and also add perhaps an Afro-optimistic sense of mm -hmm. Southern African. I think the, uh, the Southern African struggle, I mean, despite it's, uh, it's deeply flawed outcomes, and I entirely agree that South Africa is playing a sub-imperialist role uh, at this stage, that is to say the African elite. But I think it's important is that it did get rid of white minority rule, and we shouldn't discount that. And that, I think, is a victory which should be chalked up to the pan-African movement. It's, it's the Southern African struggle was a profoundly and decisively uh, Pan-Africanist uh, initiative. Of course, it didn't pan out that way. I mean, the xenophobia that's, that's currently rampant. But I think that is a critical you know, part of the legacy, mm -hmm. is that it's unlikely that any white minority regime will ever emerge within the Southern African continent. Which brings into focus, of course, the question of what were the shortcomings of that, um, of that deal, if you want to. And you, I think, alluded to that in some way on the whole question of settler colonial capitalism, which is prevalent within the US as well. And I think that brings into focus the question of reparations. Mm -hmm. I think the culpabilities of settler colonists need to be a part of the debate and discourse that we have. And we need to tweak up the reparations uh, movement demand. And that is not just, you know, uh, uh, it's also the ecological uh, debt uh, in addition to the financial uh, uh, mm -hmm. question. But, um, so that's, I think, in terms of the Southern African uh, experience. I do think that the Pan-Africanist, well, let me put it uh, more in terms of the question. If you could elaborate more on the whole um, intra-class or sub-national you know, uh, context of the African Social Forum as a fertile ground for the resurgence of a, hopefully this time, a sort of more truly transnational Pan-Africanist uh, movement. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just ask, how much, you know, I, I have to confess my ego gets bruised when people start leaving. So I just want to know how much more time do we uh, have? Okay. All right, no, that's fine. I just, I, I'm cool, but, you know, I don't want to be putting people out. That's the thing. So let's take, we'll take one more question after I respond to this last one. Um, Just to clarify, uh, yeah, I, I definitely don't want to discount the South African struggle. And if, if, that, if my remarks were interpreted in that way, um, I ask your forgiveness. 
Um, I agree very much the importance of the victory. I think, however, that many of us romanticized what we thought was going to happen. And um, we're not prepared for the, the play out of uh, the class forces there. Um, I continue to find inspiration in the South African movement, um, particularly in the union movement and among other social forces that have emerged. The, uh, the treatment action movement, um, the movement around land, I mean, there's a real excitement. And one of the things that I love when I go to South Africa is that people talk politics. And they talk politics all the time. And I mean, I just, I feel like I'm in heaven. Um, I mean, it, you don't feel like you're imposing upon somebody to have a debate. Um, so it's, it's I, I find it very, very inspiring. And I feel like there's a lot we can learn. A few years ago, I helped to organize a visit by leadership of the Service Employees International Union to South Africa to talk with their South African counterparts. And, you know, it's interesting because people from the United States normally think we have nothing to learn from anyone else in the world. And this was, this was an incredible experience. People walked away from it uh, very excited and, and it was very thought provoking for us all. Um, in terms of the African Social Forum, <laughs> I want to agree this issue of the diaspora I think maybe the Achilles heel of the African Social Forum. It was interesting, the, um, the, this year's uh, World Social Forums took place in uh, three places, Caracas, um, Bamako in Mali, and I think Karachi. Um, and the African one in Bamako, three or four weeks before it was to happen, I got a phone call from my board chair, Danny Glover, saying he had just come back from Mali and people were saying that it would be a good idea to have people from the diaspora there. Three or four weeks before, right? I mean, this is kind of absurd. It was obviously not something that was on anybody's radar screen. And, and I think that this also, this in some ways mirrors a problem within the African Union. Within the African Union, there's, there are different notions of the diaspora. And it really shocked me. Um, I, I remember reading this story about when Malcolm X went to Ghana in 64. And he gave this talk. And after the talk, some of the Ghanaians said that was a remarkable talk for a white man to give. And, and this is kind of, you know, when I first read this, I said, somebody's got to be, this got to be a joke. But but I've come to realize that there is a disconnect between many of our brothers and sisters on the continent and in the diaspora, and the other way too. Um, so, you know, in the African Union, and I have this feeling this exists within the African Social Forum, when they say the diaspora, they don't necessarily mean the same diaspora I'm talking about. They mean the African immigrant diaspora. That is the people who left voluntarily and I use that term very loosely, to go to France or, or wherever else, or to the United States, right? But they don't necessarily mean those of us that had our pack passage involuntarily arranged, right? And have been here for many generations. And there's actually been a struggle with the AU about this, um, that we are the diaspora and the immigrants are part of that but the diaspora is not founded upon the new immigrants. The diaspora is founded upon those of us who were stolen. And there is no debate on that. Right? And until the AU gets it, there will be no sixth region. They'll just be playing games on a, on a flip chart. And I think that part of what we have to do with the African Social Forum is really um, is, is to conduct that struggle so that... Um, that they are looking at the diaspora in the Western Hemisphere, in Europe. I mean, the people that were rebelling in France need to be hooked up with the African Social Forum. That doesn't mean that they don't have a relationship to what's going on in Europe, but they need to have a relationship with the African Social Forum. Um, the, the, the Brazil, having the largest concentration of people of African descent outside of Nigeria. 
I mean, that could play host to the AU. I mean, we've got to be thinking differently. And, uh, and, and so, so I think that that's one piece. The other thing that we have to think about with all of these social forums, they have great strengths, but one of the limitations is the question of power. That there's a, there's a debate within the social forum movement about whether we should even be fighting for power. And it's partly influenced by the postmodern, what I'll say somewhat neutrally, nonsense that uh, comes out that basically that we don't need to be fighting for power. That we basically just, you know, do identity struggles and resistance and affirm our identity and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And within the social forum movement, you have people that, you have some people that don't believe that we need to develop a politics to fight for power. And I think that that's a battle that needs to take place. Um, and, and this fight for power is going to look very differently in different places. You know, like in Venezuela, the fight among Afro-Venezuelans has, has, has altered form in some part because President Hugo Chavez is embracing the Afro-Venezuelan movement right, as, as a part of the Bolivarian process. In other places, in Colombia, it's going to look very different. So I think that, this, um, that we, we need to be involved in the African Social Forum, but in the Western Hemisphere, we have to make sure that Pan-African politics are part of uh, the Western Hemisphere uh, and, and the social forum movement here. And I absolutely agree with you on the issue of the environment. I mean, the world is running out of water, quite literally. And, um, and we can see this drinkable water, not oceans. And, um, and we can see this playing itself out in Africa. And you have Pentagon planners that are thinking about this, about resource wars. So we need to be thinking about it as well. Thank you for your presentation and also for this dialogue. It's been really rewarding. Um, my question is, um, I want to hear your views on whether there's a role for white folks in the 21st century Pan-African movement. And what is that, if there is? You know, it's interesting that you raise that question. Um, Driving down here, uh, it's the only positive thing that happened as a result of my plane being canceled uh, in O'Hare to fly here. I had more time to think. Um, and since there's nothing to listen to on the radio between a little bit south of Chicago <laughs> and right out here, I had a lot of time to think. Um, hey, listen, when I, uh, don't get me started. Well, you know, I, next time I try, I'm going to bring a CD-ROM wherever I go. Um, I, I was actually thinking about that question because on, on a couple of different levels. In other words, there are white South Africans that I know that have a better consciousness about Africa than some African Americans I know and are thinking in terms of the continent and thinking about the anti-racist struggle um, and not just thinking about it, they're engaged in the anti-racist struggle. I, I don't know whether that means that they're in a pan-African movement. I, I, I don't know. They are my comrades. That's the way I look at it. Um, I think that the insofar as we're talking about a struggle for social transformation, we're not talking about a racial struggle. We're talking about a struggle against racism and indeed a struggle against capitalism. And in that light, um, this is not a struggle just among and by blacks by ourselves. And part of what I worry about when I look at some of the trends that call themselves pan-African I don't think that they really are. I think that they've become ethnic, essentially, or color, color-based. I mean, when I, I was in Trinidad, and, and frankly, I was scared. You know, when I was in Trinidad, I don't mean scared for my life, but um, I was scared because you have this split in the population between East Indians and, and people of African descent. And in Guyana, I mean, what would Walter Rodney be saying? You know, I mean, just in terms of what, what's been happening there, and the way, and it's not that, I don't want to make it idyllic, that at one point everybody was, you know, it's all hunky-dory, 
But I'm, I am saying that the ethnic issue has destroyed, in many cases, what it meant to be black. And that's why I said that we have to redefine blackness, and it's not simply skin color. Um, so on one level, I can't give you a precise answer. Um, because I frankly don't know the answer. I know that in Africa, that a white person who is there, who has dedicated themselves to Africa and to fighting racism in the social movements that I've interacted with is looked at as a comrade. And if they're looked at as a comrade there, then why shouldn't they be a comrade for me too? So I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you.